It is a good one. Look at that. We are catching bluegill. We've had a real good afternoon here. Sam Lehman has just put another one in his bucket. Well, you can't see it's all full of snow, but uh, we got loads of bluegill. Gary, Bo Gary Botek has a couple. Did you catch those? Sure did. Sure did. Could be, boy, I tell you, this ice is kind of cracking around us as all five of us are together. And Paul Stanhope here has been Yanking him through the ice. We're huh? having a good time, Fred. We are having a good, we're time, having a good time. But because the ice is still a little thin, we're going to spread out. Just a little bit. <laughs> but you stay tuned. It's time for some ice fishing tips here on the Practical Sportsman. The ice is firm, at least near shore. Time to try a popular lake in Berry County. Paul Stanhope hauls his sled on a toboggan. Gary Botek is dragging one of his homemade ice fishing sleds, plus a plastic sled for some of John Ford's camera gear. Now, I'm carrying my bucket, plus the Gary Botek sled we'll have plans for in the upcoming Practical Sportsman magazine. Now, as we get to one of the first productive spots of the season, Sam Lehman is pulling up a little bass. Now, it's out of season, so it'll go back. Paul Stanhope tried this spot earlier in the day, and he caught bluegill. Well, here we are right next to shore. Um, this is the best place to fish? Well, the fish have been working this area pretty much the last few days, Fred. And uh, I was out earlier this morning and uh, located a good group of fish here. Uh, I think the possibilities of getting a few fish on your line today are uh, real good. You know, the, the holes, you've already put some holes through the ice mm -hmm. right here. And I notice as we stand every now and then I feel a crack. Oh, hold it, this isn't bad. This no, isn't not bad. Not. We're running about That's four like, to five inches. Yeah, four to five inches. Yeah. We're okay. I would say we got three, three and a half good ice. Uh, that last thaw we had here when we got the rain hurt the top a little bit. But uh, we've had some cold temperatures here the last three to four days. And yeah. the ice has firmed up real good. I don't think we've... Got any problem, not at all. Well, if we did, uh, I don't think Gary would be out here with us. No, that's... No. <laughs> Gary Botek went through the ice a few years ago. It was a pretty hairy experience, so he doesn't like to take chances on first ice. But some anglers do take the risk. Now, for bluegills, one of the favorite grub-type baits is called a mousy because of its odd little tail. It's, it's small and juicy, though, and bluegills like that. I'm starting with a sensitive float balanced for a small teardrop, which works well as long as the fish aren't too lazy. But today, we're dealing with lazy fish. Now, sitting on a boat cushion is comfortable and warm, and you never know. It might come in handy to toss to somebody who might fall into some open water. So a boat cushion, you know, is practical and safe. I mentioned that the fish are lazy now. They want that bait moving at least a little bit, and that's why Paul Stanhope had better success with a spring bobber. There's a hit. There's a fish. Really? Paul uses his ice fishing reel to bring the fish in. A lot of fishermen don't use that technique, but it can be practical. Just eat it. Some nice hooks on them, right in the top lip. That's, that's nice. Well, there's Paul's second gill. Now, I was sticking to the sensitive float, which, like I said, works extremely well when fish hit a motionless bait. But Sam Lehman said, "Not today. You're not. You're only fishing one spot. You can fish up and down. So with the spring bottle, you can follow them better. Follow them better. You can put it right in their mouth. You see, you got a fish right there, right on that edge of that red." Where the yellow and the red come come together, there's a fish there, see? If you had a spring bobber, you'd, you'd jig it all the time, and they take it while they're jigging. Today, that bait has to be moving. Mm -hmm. Now, hold it. You have a spring bobber on your rig, right? Right. Why don't you get right down here? Right next? No, seriously. Right yeah. Next now, I'll, I'll pull mine out, and we're going to see if we can't get this fish. You know, fish flashers never used to be used in ice fishing, but Gary Botek and I found that they can really help. Hey, these are the kinds of things that make fishing fun. And talk about inexpensive. It really is. There's, there's hardly any cheaper activity to do than ice fishing. 
That's you don't true. have to have a boat to get out here like you would in the summer. Okay, now, the man with the spring bobber is going down. You don't even have a whole lot of fancy, uh, you have a, what, a number 22 hook? No. No, this isn't that, no. Okay, now here we can, can watch this. Down. I, oops. See if that fish yeah. is there, I can dig it up, catch him. Notice how I drew a fish up here, up near the top. That, that's just by putting that bait down through there. The green line on the flasher just above the bottom, that's Sam's bait and his teardrop. It's just over the top of a group of fish that show up orange. Now, what are you looking at? Your spring bobber or the... Uh... Spring bobber. Okay. So you're not worried about the electronics here? No. Oh. Now, I found that detecting movement in a spring bobber was a little difficult while jigging because I'm not used to it. But here, a fish bumps it. Watch. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm sold. <laughs> That's all it takes. Huh? No kidding. And he pulled it out, and it's a dandy. Oh, man. Hard fishing. Yeah, hard fishing. Then you need a custom rod. Is that a rod you made? Yes. Sam's ice fishing rod was custom made by himself, a handle of laminated mahogany to fit his hand. The reel is on the bottom. Uh, he says this rod is lightweight and strong. The rod is thin boron, ultra sensitive. Sam is using two pound test line today, a teardrop sweetened with bait and a small split shot eight or 10 inches up. Talk about a lesson in ice fishing. We're getting it right here. You're the only guy out here with the uh, graph, with the flasher. That's new. The man that started it all. Was... Now we got one right up here, John. Right up there, that guy has one on his sled, a nice one. There's a fish right down there. See where my bait is? And he's, he's just straight in, right in there. Let's to back up a little bit. So your bait is about how far off the bottom right now? Two feet? About a foot. I'm coming up because there's a, see that fish? There, that's my bait. I got tangled up on the line. So your line was higher than you thought. I got a knot in it. Which is nice to have a day like this that is not windy because when you're using this real light line, what are you using? Two pound? Two Four? Pound. Two pound? Uh, I, I imagine there's some days you come out here where you find the fish are suspended a little bit, huh? Well, yeah, three foot off is the normal rule for this lake. So when, you, when you're talking about jigging, I mean, you're talking about micro jigging i mean you're not moving that very much well, you got to move it all the time to catch fish but i mean the spring bobber is moving more than i imagine the the your teardrop and your bait is well the, that when they stop that that's all you get for a bite they don't normally take it right down there's one that picked it up i'm just letting him i'm force feeding him right now <laughs> We got another one? Yep. He's not very big. No, he's not. Caught the hook but in the hole. It's so smart. it proves the point. You know, to be a good ice fisherman, it takes a knack. There's no doubt about it. Experience takes experience, but it doesn't necessarily take much equipment. In fact, this reminds me of a statement I made on last week's show after I went fishing with Sam Lehman. Oh, I want to take that comment back. Put them in a bucket, take it out fishing. In fact, you see a lot of fishermen using buckets, flip them upside down and sit on them. And you know, those fishermen aren't the dyed-in-the-wool ice fishermen. Okay, it's apology time to Sam Lehman and all of you other dyed-in-the-wool ice fishermen who don't have fancy ice fishing sleds, who just take buckets. I mean, all Sam used was a bucket where he put his flasher in here, his fishing rod, and a load of fish that he caught. In fact, he sat right on the open top of this bucket when he wanted to sit down. 
I don't know what to say. If you want to talk with Sam, by the way, you can often find him at Earl Sport Shop, which is at the corner of M43 and M66. That's when Sam isn't out ice fishing this winter. He's an expert on that uh, little sneaky bobber. What I'm going to do, Sam, and you're probably not going to use this. You probably have access to them. But I'm going to send you one of these spin seats, which I use. This is a, a seat that fits on any bucket, and it spins like that. You can put it on top of your bucket and uh, sit on it. Sam probably won't use this because he catches so many fish, he's always throwing them in his bucket. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you that anyway, Sam, and let me take that back. Dyed-in-the-wool ice fishermen don't necessarily have a lot of equipment. Now, let's, let's take a look at our fish room and talk about some fish. One real key you can learn here at the museum by looking at our fish display is what a fish eats by the type and size of its mouth. I mean, all these fish are different, and the ones with the big mouths take big bait. Now, in the winter, we do a lot of pan fishing. Now, here's a rock bass, for example. Look at the size of the mouth on the rock bass. That can take a minnow with a big hook. But most people tend to fish for bluegills with little teeny mouths. That's why we need little teeny hooks, little teeny baits. The fish in the winter are lethargic. They just don't move much and they don't eat a lot. So remember, small hooks, small baits, that's going to catch you more fish in the winter. Now, it's home video time. Home video recorders have brought a new dimension to outdoor experiences. We're watching this eight-point buck because Frank McKenzie from Montrose stopped by the Shiawassee National Refuge on his way home from work just about every evening during bow season. Well, it was actually the, the, basically the 20th of October until the opening of gun season, and he got some incredible tape of big bucks. The refuge isn't open to hunting until gun season, and Frank would sit at the base of a tree for an hour or two every evening, catching many bucks and does in their natural habitat. Now, they're not being hunted, but look how spooky they are. That's the life of a deer in the wild. Always wired, always wary, always on pins and needles with eyes, ears, and noses alert for danger. Now, this buck has a deformed set of antlers, which usually indicates it had an accident, some physical injury, sometime in the past year. <laughs> I love watching deer grow through the water. I don't know what it is, but, you know, whether a buck is chasing a doe or just walking, or, or here's a big boy that's checking the licking branch over a scrape. You can see the scrape by his feet. Deer behavior is always interesting, and what you're seeing here is just a small portion of the footage Frank McKenzie shot this past season. We're searching through his three-week collection of daily videos for deer behavior that is unusual. He has some footage that is really hard to get, and we'll be sharing it with you on future shows. But for now, doesn't this buck get your adrenaline pumping? <laughs> Wait till you see what Frank has coming up on some of our future shows. They'll knock you out. Well, Frank has not only shot some spectacular deer video, but he has some great home video on fishing we're going to look at in a future show. Now let's move into the kitchen where we have a new format for recipes. We're having the people who sent the recipes to us come in and fix it. And I'll tell you, this weather is perfect for this recipe. I know it looks like just regular old chili. This is not regular old chili. First of all, it was made with venison. Second of all, it contains tequila. It's called tequila venison chili, and it was sent in by Kim Lovernick, and you're from Taylor. Mm -hmm. And you brought with you? Jeff Malone from Trenton. Jeff Malone. You are, uh, of course, wearing the same shirts, yeah. and you look like a couple. Yes. You yeah. are a couple. Trying yes, we are. But, oh, try, okay, <laughs> well, anyway. <laughs> well, the subject is tequila, venison, and chili, yeah. and uh, you two have gotten acquainted and and fish together, hunt together. Yeah, mm -hmm. we uh, do a lot of that. I taught her how to fly fish, and uh, we go up north quite often. Do a lot of the outdoor mm -hmm. activities together. Okay, and um, how does this fit in <laughs> to these well, activities? At least fits into the <laughs> to the chili. She's the one that she's the one that made. Let her tell. Tequila? Well, Where does this? How did you get this idea to put tequila in chili? Well, I like to cook with 
any type of alcohol I can. And um, making chili, I was trying to figure out what alcohol would go good in chili and what better Mexican you alcohol go, is there is tequila. Do you go to the meetings every week? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what? No. No, no. Now, hold it. There are, people, there are people who object to, they say, you shouldn't put the alcohol in here and keep having these recipes with alcohol. Now, you say you cook with a lot of alcohol. Why? Yes. Um, it, I think it brings out the flavor of the meat. Um, every Thanksgiving when I do my turkey, I mm -hmm. use a can of beer inside my turkey. And I did one turkey mm. with beer one year and, a, and another turkey with, um, with the traditional butter. And the turkey with the beer went. How much, so. how much tequila is in here? Um, about a cup. A cup? Yes. Slug. That's a slug of tequila. <laughs> Jeff? But the pot's Try pretty something. big. Tell me, can I taste the tequila you in here? You can smell I'm not it. Sure. Smell mm -hmm. it when, when you're cooking it. Hmm. I mean, this is this is really tasty chili. Yes, it's hot. It's hot. It's hot, but look at some of the ingredients we have here. You have your standard green pepper, celery, onion, uh, cumin, which is a Mexican, it gives it that Mexican flavor. Mm -hmm. Garlic, salt, crushed pepper, paprika, which isn't really too hot. Um, Chili powder. Is there much in there? Uh, there's about a quarter cup of chili powder in there. Quarter of a cup? <laughs> Can you feel it on your throat? <laughs> We're talking about some kidney beans here. This is, uh, you can these yourself? Yes. The canned tomatoes, mm -hmm. um, tequila, of course, and some cheese. You yes. put cheese in, mm -hmm. in this. And the crackers are wow. optional. They're optional. What? Wow, you said. Right here. <laughs> huh? Right down here. I think it's a chili. I got a hunk of chili powder or something. Is this, did I miss this? Yes, you did. Okay, this is a, a garlic. <laughs> Close. That's your favorite. Yeah, <laughs> this is, wow, this is chili that is very tasty. You, you feed this to other people yes. who must say the same thing that Jeff said. Wow. Yeah, it's a little hot on the taste. What would you do to tone it down? Just Well, you can back off on the um, crushed red pepper mm -hmm. and use a little bit less of the chili powder, but um, more so backing off on that red pepper. I also have some people who add Tabasco to it. So, so they want more heat. Yes. So this doesn't have to be a hot chili recipe, but no. it's definitely interesting. What about if you take away the tequila? I don't know. You never tried it that <laughs> way? <laughs> hmm. Well, you know, boy, this is great stuff. Chili is supposed to be hot, uh, but I, I can taste it. The more you eat, the, the hotter it gets on your, on your throat there. Well, to a point. Yeah. And then pretty soon, you know, it can start going on. I mean, you seem like such a perfect couple. <laughs> and, well, and you have different last names. Yes. <laughs> you guys, you, well, now hold it here. Well, she did extend my uh, honey season by buying me a muzzle loader. So like, she bought you a muzzle yeah. loader. She cooks <laughs> venison. She cooks with a lot of alcohol. <laughs> it sounds, she fly fishes. Yeah. yeah she hey, does. there's people sitting out here saying, this is the perfect woman. <laughs> Jeff, what's the deal? Oh, boy. Uh, Can we come up with a date? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, do you want to? Do you want to get hit? Well, yeah. What? What about you, Jeff? Yeah, very much someday. Very much someday. <laughs> yeah. Folks, she's a great one. Is folks? Great. This is this is partly a setup on Jeff, <laughs> but uh, but we're having fun with it. They are a great couple. You've come up with this great tequila, venison, chili, that is absolutely superb. And good luck to you. And I, hope I enjoyed that, being here. Hey. And I'm looking forward to getting an invitation. Hey, okay. Enjoy being here. To that big day. All righty. Which is not November 15th. That's no, right. no, no. <laughs> but there might, right. there might be another one in the future. <laughs> hey, great. And a toast okay. to hey. you. Thank you. Thanks. Now, all the ingredients and instructions by Kim Lovernick on how to put her tequila venison chili together is in the December-January issue of the Practical Sportsman magazine. Now, right here, we have a photo of John Wildfong and his brother Brian from Mancelona showing the 20-pound Tom turkey with a 10-and-a-half-inch beard. They snuck up on a, a group of Toms during the November season in Antrim County. Now, in the magazine, I also did an analysis here of the brands of guns which turkey hunters use. The top choice was Remington. 53 out of 147 hunters chose Remington. That's a third. Now, here's a picture of another fall turkey with a 10 and a half inch beard. Bob Snap from Clare snuck up on it in Clare County with an Ithaca 12 gauge. Now, that kind of surprises me because Bob is a custom gun maker. 
He does a lot of excellent high-class rifles for big game hunters. His turkey gun, though, is an Ithaca Model 37. Now, here's another magazine photo of 69-year-old Tom Hoffman from Traverse City. He uses a gun, hunts bears behind hounds. That's how bear hunting was always done years ago. This 300-pound Bruin is a real trophy from Ontonagon County. Now, I found it interesting that of the 19 entries here of gun hunters who have taken bears, 10 were behind hounds, but 15 of these 19 hunters said they used bait. Now, this is one of the things that has caused controversy among bear hunters. Now, a lot of bow hunters, in fact, I'd say all of them, set out bait piles and put their blind next to the bait. Now, when dog hunters come up and use a bow hunter's bait pile to start their dogs, that's when the, literally the fur flies among bear hunters, and that's what has caused the controversy, one of the things that has caused controversy in bear hunting. But now here's Jim Bratton from Algonac. He got this 453-pound bear in Ontario with a 74-pound high country bow from a tree stand using bait. Boy, that's a monster. And check out this buck. 13 points, a big one from Sheboygan County. Scott Raymond from Sheboygan got it bow hunting with a 60-pound browning compound. Foot-long tines, a great photo. Let's make Scott Raymond our practical sportsman deer hunter of the week. Well, look, last weekend, dumping snow all over us. Mother Nature also did us a favor by getting the temperatures down near zero. The lakes are frozen, lots of good ice. Let's go to our local map now to find out the reports from our guides around the state on the outdoor calendar. You know, you don't have to participate in all these activities. Many of them you can go and observe, watch, but at this time of year, make sure you're dressed warm, wear practical clothing, and I want to see you back here next week.